Hello everyone, my name is Latrice Hall and this week we're going to discuss social influence and group processes. This week we looked at social influence and how it's essentially the way in which people are affected by others. Now social influence can occur on an individual level, it can occur within a group or even on an institutional level. It can also be helpful or harmful. Social influence occurs on a continuum, ranging from the least degree of pressure with conformity, followed by compliance where more pressure is placed on, a, on an individual, to outright obedience, which is a result of the most direct demanding pressures of social influence. And when we speak of pressures, this pressure can be real pressure or even imagined. Now, it's important to remember that there are generally cultural variations between cultures as well as within the same culture. And the ways in which different cultures view and respond to various forms of social influence can even differ from one generation to the next. The text also described the fundamental features of groups, which include roles as well as norms. And they also talked about how these can foster group cohesiveness. Although many people assume that working in a group is more effective and efficient than working alone, this is not always the case. When individuals are part of an actual group or even just a member in a collective or a crowd, the presence of other people can result in social facilitation whereby people do better on easy tasks and worse on hard tasks, social loafing, which is decreased effort and output, and even de-individualization, where there is no sense of an individual identity which can result in deviant behavior. It's important to note that while there can be benefits to groups, they can also result in some deleterious consequences. So there are five discussion topics that I'd like to focus on and discuss more in depth. I'll also discuss the common themes and concepts that are found among the Cass and textbook as well as the two scholarly articles for this week. The five topics are conformity, majority influence, minority influence, group norms, and cultural considerations. According to Cass and Fine and Marcus, conformity is the tendency of individuals to change their perceptions, beliefs, and behaviors to align with those of the group. So as I had mentioned, the three types of social influence, conformity, compliance, and obedience, occur on a continuum, ranging from the least amount of pressure placed on a person to the most direct and demanding. So conformity actually involves the least amount of pressure. People might conform due to informational influence, which is when they're uncertain about something and they think that the other person is correct or because of normative influence, which involves being afraid of the negative social consequences of deviance, like ostracism. There are also factors that determine if a person is more or less likely to conform as with majority and minority influence, but it's important to remember that not everyone conforms. Moscovici's theory was noted by Hawley, Hosh, and Bouverd, as well as Cass and Fine and Marcus, and described how majorities have influence because of power, control, and sheer number of members. However, conformity due to this type of majority influence increases as the number of group members increase, but only up to about three or four members. After that, it's not really a significant increase. Social norms also can encourage conformity, but only when these norms are known and attended to. Research has shown that there are gender differences in conformity, with women conforming more in face-to-face -face interactions and men conforming more in private. Minority influence, or how dissenters affect change within a group, is largely impacted by consistency. While majorities have influence because of power and control, minorities of a group induce private conformity 
or conversion by having people rethink their original beliefs by being forceful and unyielding while at the same time appearing to have an open mind. It's easier for people to not conform when there is an ally who also deviates from these norms. Reese and Wallace found that when adolescents are in the minority position as non-drinkers in a group of friends who drink alcohol, they're more likely to resist drinking if they have another friend who does not drink. What's interesting is that they can cause their drinking group members to actually decrease their alcohol intake as well as quit drinking altogether. By staying firm and consistent in their viewpoint, minorities in a group can cause other group members to rethink their own belief system. This consistent behavior is what takes the attention away from the mainstream, allowing for these nonconformists to affect change. Social influence can easily be seen within groups. Groups establish norms, which are basically the rules of conduct for its members. These rules can be formal or informal, and there is typically pressure to conform to the group's norms because any deviations from the established norms is seen as a threat to the members' sense of uniformity and cohesiveness. Casson and others noted that groups differ in their tolerance of deviations from norms. Some groups value uniformity and frown upon deviations, and other groups value heterogeneity. Depending on how tolerant the group is to violations of the norms, if a member goes against these norms, the results can potentially be devastating for the individual. Hawley and others discussed how teammates on a football team supported a fellow player, although he displayed deviant behavior, but teammates on a hockey team ostracized a fellow player who displayed, who displayed deviant behavior. Now the authors explained that the football teammates likely supported the fellow player because he didn't violate group specific norms. Conversely, the other team likely ostracized their teammate because group specific norms were indeed violated. This is a perfect example of how groups differ in how they react to deviations from their established norms. Culture plays a part in virtually every aspect of social psychology, so it should be no surprise that there are cultural variations regarding social influence and group processes. Just as cultures differ in their respective norms, they also differ in their expectations of members to adhere to those norms. In the caste context, this is referred to as tightness and looseness within cultures. Tight cultures are described as having strict norms with little tolerance for deviation, while loose cult cultures have more tenuous norms and are more tolerant of deviation. Research suggests that individualistic cultures typically have lower conformity rates as compared to collectivistic cultures, but it should be noted that cultures can change their values and expectations over time with successive generations. I now offer the following two questions for discussion. According to Cass and Fine and Marcus, cultural influences affect the negotiation of a social dilemma. How specifically does culture affect this negotiation process? And how might the recognition of a superordinate identity in the form of a shared biblical worldview mitigate potential conflict? Hassan and others asserted that social norms engender conformity, but only when people know and focus on these social norms. How do social networking sites encourage adolescents' misconceptions of what is actually normal? <laughs>